Well, hello and welcome back to the Zeitcast, everybody. So I am especially pleased to have the right reverend, the legend, <laughs> Carlos Rodriguez. I started to say he's in the house. He's actually not in the house. He's in his house. I'm in my house. It's in, hot Puerto in Puerto Rico. Rico. Goodness gracious, it's hot. Okay, so <laughs> Carlos, you like, uh, I, I don't want to humiliate you, but you got to yes. give me a second here because I tell people this all the time. Oh my. And I don't even know how you feel about this. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is that I am. I don't know where I belong. I don't know where I fit. But this yeah. is what I tell folks. I'm like, whatever it is that I am, that's what Carlos is. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It makes no sense. There is no box for us. <laughs> There's not. But I'm like, he makes me feel seen and known and understood. <laughs> so yes. uh, Carlos is the founder of the Happy uh, Nonprofit, nonprofit yeah. which yeah. is doing amazing work in Puerto Rico. When did you move back, by the way? How long has it been? Um, just a, actually a year last week. So we've been here for a year and a week back home in Puerto Rico. He's doing extraordinary work there, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. He sure. is a just a dazzling preacher and writer. Um, I love his book, Drop the Stones, not just because I worked forward to it, but I love the book. <laughs> um, and he really is honestly one of my favorite preachers in the world. And I just feel like, uh, and I don't throw this Sweet out lightly, me. just one of the true, one of the truly prophetic voices for oh. our time and the moment we're in. So Carlos, so it's sweet. funny, but well, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. And I tell people, like, I really, I don't, um, I'm evangelistic about things and people that I love, <laughs> but I tell people all the time to follow you, to listen to oh. every sermon talk. Oh, and I didn't even mention like, now yeah. Carlos is basically responsible for like half my wardrobe too. So like these <laughs> I know, amazing I keep shirts. Seeing, I know. I keep seeing you wearing hoodies and shirts. That's so that's so great, man. Can I get so some great. kind of commission for all this product placement? <laughs> you actually like, can. You actually can. Yes. I'm gonna hook you up. I'm gonna <laughs> hook you because we do have like an ambassador program. You can Sweet. make like, you can make some good money off of that. Because I do sure. all, I'll do all the product placement for you. I just so believe in the message that oh, love, you know, I've got multiple versions of the love that neighbor's shirt, but yeah, I love yeah, them yeah. all. Yeah. Um, Thanks, so again, not just to, to flatter you, but part of what's great about this conversation for me, and I hate to preface every conversation this way, but it is yeah. all time. I'm sure all times are complicated. I do feel like mm -hmm. this one uh, is uniquely complex in some ways. And I just feel like, um, the gift that you have to speak in the moment, and yet, as we were just catching up even before we get started, mm -hmm. I know you're navigating your own tension and yeah. bewilderment, too. So yeah. I feel like I need conversations like this with you <laughs> as much for the sake of my own soul as yeah. anything. So yeah. nothing else, I will feel a little bit more sane for being yeah. able to talk with you about this. So. <laughs> I, know the, I know the feeling. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't realize... Because we're so interconnected, you know, 2019 and Instagram and Facebook and now Sub and everything else. But I didn't realize how lonely it would be in Puerto Rico, to be honest with you. Mm. I mean, it's great with my family, no doubt about it. Just being back home with family. I have five sisters, my parents, my wife and our kids are really, we're really loving our life and experience in Puerto Rico. But in, in the context of these conversations, it does feel like a lonely place in that sense. And mm. I've been in this in between, right? Because I've I've tried too hard to be a bridge, and the problem with being a bridge yeah. is that maybe people walk all over you. Because I'm trying too hard to be this bridge in between these two worlds: the world that I used to be part of, you know, a more mm -hmm. charismatic, conservative world, um, where I got so much good out of, but mm -hmm. it, in a way, and the word betrayals is maybe too strong. But I felt so betrayed in the Trump era mm -hmm. from that world. And yet now more involved, maybe more the progressive world and what used to be called the emergent church back in the day and whatnot. But like you're saying, it's like, do, where do I really fit? Mm. But I'm here in Puerto Rico and I'm doing work that is celebrated by one side of the church, yeah. maybe more the progressive side. Hey, it's so good that you're doing work in Puerto Rico. But to be honest with you, bro, it's more the conservative side that's sending money and people to actually mm. do the work. Right. Mm. So I'm here in this really weird in between trying to really live out that whole concept that you're so good at preaching about. The table of the Lord is always open yeah. to everybody. And we don't get to decide who gets to sit or who gets to eat or who gets to participate in it. So mm -hmm. it is a lonely place because sometimes I'm hosting teams maybe more on the conservative side. And I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for their help and their money and their hands and feet here in Puerto Rico. And yet having these really painful conversations that really is like salt on a wound that's still fresh. 
And then I'm having these beautiful opportunities yes. with more progressive churches, people that I'm connecting with and events that I'm getting to speak at. Um, and yet having painful conversations about, and Brandy Miller, uh, our, our dear friend, she likes to say, you know, I'm not going to condemn people who are in process because I used to be in that yeah. process. And I needed people to walk that process with me. So mm-hmm. let's not forget the people that are in the process. So mm-hmm. anyways, it, it's just painful, right? It's just, it is a painful time. It can't be denied. I feel the pain because I'm losing friends yes. still to this day. Years, yes. you know, what me is too. it, two and a half years since mm-hmm. Trump won? And even before that, I'm losing mm-hmm. friends, losing support, losing money, losing people that would come to Puerto Rico to help, losing people that would... In, in the past would have jumped on a missionary trip evangelistic thing to Mexico to help the people there. Now it's a political thing. Now right. it's a Trump said, we say thing. And it's just, it's painful to actually do the work of justice when there's a lot of people talking about it, but it's just hard to do it. <laughs> it really is. It just, uh, sometimes, so I'm ho- sometimes I sound more hopeful this time. It's a bit more painful. Yeah. I mean, so many questions I want to ask you, Carlos. I mean, one, I'm wondering if you, like me, mm. have had like 30 or 40 times where you thought you'd get used to that or you were over it or like, well, now I've experienced enough rejection in that way to where I'm okay. Mm. Not really. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really stop hurting. It doesn't stop hurting. When doesn't. These are folks where you've had a deep sense of yeah. spiritual, personal Friendship, connection, a yeah, sense of family, community. Yeah. Hosted in my house, you know, staying with us, eating with my kids. Um, people that I pastored in Raleigh when I was a pastor there. People that, while you know, our, our second son Sebastian was born premature, and we had weeks in the in the NICU, and they were the ones bringing us food and taking care of us. Right? We're not talking about just random people that were kind of Facebook friends. I'm talking about people that I did life with. Mm-hmm. Um, that that would pray over me as we're in the process of adopting our daughter, that walked that journey with us, that put money into a, into our lives, yeah. into, right? That would celebrate my sermons, that would challenge me, that would give me feedback, right? So it's it really is, it, it's, it's harder when you're actually doing life with people. Yeah. I, it, it is easier if it's just a kind of in, te- in the technology world, it's easier to just shut off somebody, unfollow, yes. mute them. And for yes. a lot of times I've had to do that, for love, sure. not like sure. in a, I got to get rid of those people. They're stupid. No, I, I love them too yeah. much to be to be reading the crap they're putting out. I just can't yeah. handle it. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, I don't have the right words. I don't have the right process. It is painful. Sometimes I kind of like, yeah, Jesus suffered for the gospel. So you should feel mm-hmm. good about this. And I'm like, what? I'm not Jesus. Number one. And yeah. number two, um, it still hurts. And I don't know how to process. I don't know how to deal with it. And yet mm-hmm. I still want to continue to do the work. I still right. want to move forward towards more inclusion, more welcoming, more hope, yes. more kindness, more service. So it's like it's 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 an impossible scenario. And I'm just trying to, you know, sit with Jesus in this space. So help me out here, Carlos, because mm-hmm. I want to I want to frame this for everybody. <laughs> like, okay, when I think about who you are, the mm-hmm. intersections you live at, how you inhabit the space, sure. um, you're you're a humble guy. Honor does matter to you. You honor where you come from. Yeah. Um, you, you, the diversity across the body of Christ that you spoke about. I mean, I feel like you're just. I feel like you carry yourself with so much, with with dignity, with joy. There's even when you talk about heavy things, there's a lightness of spirit. But kind of maybe weightier than all that in this conversation, the work that you're doing in Puerto Rico seems to me to be what ostensibly should be the least controversial stuff yeah, imaginable. Yeah. So just for a second, yeah. t- to make sure people are just kind of up to speed, yeah, just say I, just a bit about what you're actually doing and thanks, before I good. press further. Yeah, that's good. Because So long story short, my second book, which you wrote the forward for, came out. And that night that my book was coming out, I'm doing this book signing in Barnes and Nobles in Durham, North Carolina, and all these people are coming out to read my, you know, I'm standing there reading my book and people are, I'm get, I'm signing books. That night was when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. Mm. I mean, devastated the island. It, there's not one town, not one corner of Puerto Rico that wasn't affected. And a, a couple of days later, another friend of ours um, gave me a phone call. I won't say who he was because he was angry and he was like, it was almost like 
he was really Old Testament prophet at that moment. Mm. I mean, he got consumed with this fire and he left me a voice and he said, don't you freaking waste your life talking about this stuff without doing it. You go to Puerto mm. Rico, you're going to get invitations. You're a good preacher. You wrote a nice book, but don't waste your life just talking about it. Do the work, do the work. I mean, mm. it was like three minute. <laughs> uh, one of those Old Testament prophets that you're hoping for like the one nice verse at the yeah. end and it never comes. It was wow. kind of like that. But I ended up coming to moving, coming to Puerto Rico sporadically and uh, finally moving to Puerto Rico. So we rebuild houses, mostly for single mothers and the elderly. There's mm. still about 38,000 homes that still have blue tarps, meaning when the hurricane came, the roofing left, um, was taken by the storm. FEMA or the local government, somebody put a blue tarp. That was kind of the solution for everybody. Mm. And there's still 38,000 homes with blue tarps, mostly people, mostly people who are in incredible need. We just helped a mom. Mm. She struggles with um, schizophrenia. Um, she, she, she's on depression, um, depression medication. She has two kids. She's a single mom. We just fixed her house last week. Maria mm. happened two years ago. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of people we're helping. And the legitimate thing is the administration, the Trump administration, did not respond well to Puerto Rico. Thousands of people died. They kept saying only 60. I've heard of, personally, I've heard more of more than 30 stories, just this one guy, of mm -hmm. people who died, heart attacks, people didn't get medication. So we've been rebuilding homes, supporting um, some of the efforts by um, the smaller local government, partnering with Catholic ministries, partnering with Samaritan's Purse. I don't, I don't care who's helping. I just want to help. And there's a lot of people that still need the help. So eventually, as the conversation, it was almost like every three months, the president would tweet about Puerto Rico. Oh, they got all they need and they're just complaining and they just need to sort themselves out. Uh, well, we did sort ourselves out. We literally just got rid of the government, this corrupt government. We, we marched yeah. for 12 days um, and, and zero violence in the protest and nobody died. And it was one of the great, you know, demonstrations of democracy of a country stepping up to do the right thing. So we're Puerto Ricans are trying to do the right thing, church mm -hmm. people, non-church people. And we're do and we're literally here hosting teams to rebuild mm -hmm. homes. Mm -hmm. And somehow so that's too political. Unfortunately. That's and, 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 and so to the rub there, I mean, your, mm. your background is deeply charismatic, Pentecostal-like Deep, mind. Deeply. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, you could start talking in We could start having this conversation in tongues at any moment. It, uh, yeah. Tongues interpretation. We're it's having coming, this baby. conversation in English just for the sake of everyone else because we thought it wouldn't be as ed edifying as uh, us. It's so, for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, want y'all to be edified. So, <laughs> so my... Um, so, so you just were tweeting about this yesterday, how very mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. major donors, mm -hmm. large ministries, folks that have really helped support what you're doing yeah. are pulling out. What yeah. specifically is happening? What's the critique yeah. that all of a sudden folks find the work that you're the work and witness mm -hmm. of a ministry that's rebuilding homes in Puerto Rico is controversial. Mm -hmm. What, what is it exactly that's so provocative yeah. about what well, you're doing? We've had waves of that, right? Since we moved here, we've had waves of people like, are you helping in Puerto Rico so that you can say mm. that you're helping, but because Trump didn't, you're being too political. Mm. We've had seasons of that. This last few weeks has been extremely painful, and it has to do more actually with the work we started to do in Tijuana. So, of course, there's, there's a crisis at the border, um, and we, as a Latino who's also an American citizen, who lives in the great in between. I'm, yeah. I carry an American passport, but I live the immigrant experience when I moved to America. Not, mm -hmm. not in terms of the paperwork, but in terms of how I'm treated, of my language, yeah. et cetera, right? I have all that. So I, I live in this great in between. And I'm this, we've decided as a nonprofit, hey, let's get involved. Who are the people who are doing great work? There's World Relief and there's Global Immersion, John Hutchkins right there in San Diego. Yeah. Let's find the people that are doing the work at the border and let's get involved. Because, you know, through our merchandise and through our platforms, we can kind of draw attention to it. Long story short, we end up going to Tijuana about a month and a half ago. Um, we start helping with two shelters. Basically, we there's a, a shelter and a camp. Um, and, and offering legal assistance to the migrants that are there. And I love it. We met with a pastor who turned his church building into a shelter. And he's like, don't call them migrants. We call them guests. 
they're our mm-hmm. guests. And then if they need to be here for two months, we'll, we'll, they'll be our guests. And if they need to be here for 10 years, they're our guests. We love them. And so learning by being there, by being on the ground, by having conversations, mm-hmm. by getting involved. And, and that has that almost told people, and this was their interpretation, okay, so what Carlos is doing is finding what Trump is doing wrong and then trying to Christianize it by doing some sort of mission trip to there. And he, oh, that's just I too see. political. That's that's kind of mm. the right the 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 connections they're making, and in a way, mm. I, I wouldn't say it's totally wrong. I'm trying to see the things that are wrong at the moment, and I'm trying to respond, but not just with a tweet. But hey, here's a tweet about what's wrong, and here's an opportunity for you to get involved. Yes, here's some money that you can give to these different organizations that we're partnering with here's a trip that you can come with us you can see firsthand you can get involved not to be a white savior not to do a cheap handout but to actually feed on the ground get to touch and love and help and support Mm. so that's become somehow too political Mm. and yeah unfortunately big donors big people that were supporting sending teams etc to puerto rico are now saying we've been told we can't do that anymore how do you make sense, if you can make sense, of what that framework is they're operating from theologically? Like what like what what is the grid? Like where is where is the transgression here exactly in what you're doing? Is it is it Trump is God's man and this is somehow like you're coming in? Like what is like what what exactly is is, is happening in that theologically? Yeah, in, a, in a way, it, it I, I hate to simplify it, but it is as simple as that especially in more of the charismatic Pentecostal world, we have these prophetic words. We have these great men of God who are anointed, who we trusted for so long to lead us, right? Um, And they're saying, Trump has been chosen. We've laid our hands on him at the White House. He's ending abortion forever in the whole nation, in the history of mankind. Um, He's putting these guys in the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, yes, Car- there's, there must be something wrong with Carlos and his ministry. There must be something devious because he doesn't have the clarity that we have about right what Trump mm-hmm. represents. And yeah, we wish he wouldn't tweet like he does, but everything else is amazing. Mm-hmm. And any any sense of any isms, racism, nationalism, sexism, as soon as you start to address that as a sin, as something that needs to be dealt with, as something that needs to be called out, Mm. Right. That's just left of propaganda. That's just the language of the other side. And immediately you're just disregarded. You're either dumb. You're not anointed enough. You don't really have the revelation. So why would we give you money? Why would we send our teams to you, Mm. et cetera, et cetera. It really is, Mm. unfortunately, as simple as that. And fortunately, it is as simple as that because we can talk about it, address it and start to challenge it in love, of course. How does how have those experiences that you're continuing to have, mm. how, how do you process that in terms of your own faith, in terms of your own soul? Like what, what does that do to you? Yeah. So that's the hard part for me because I grew up in a pretty broken home, alcoholism, mm. abuse, brokenness. I'm the son of both of my parents, second marriage. Mm. But there was this weird in the midst of like the mess that my parents were making. We were always family. Mm. And when it's time to have dinner together, I call my dad's ex-wife mom. Mm. I have photos of my parents and their ex-husbands and wives and all our kids for Christmas. We have photos Mm. together. And there was always this sense of no matter what, we belong to each other. Yeah. We're going to have we're going to we're going to have arguments and we're going to call it out. My parents ended up separating. My mom did an amazing brave thing and left them and said enough of the abuse enough of the brokenness. For a year they were separated. They got back together. There were all these conditions that she put on my dad. To this day they have a great marriage. So I've so in my family life I saw the great brokenness and divide. And we keep talking about like this is the most divided we've been as a nation. We've always been divided as a nation. I mean, we've yeah. had the Civil War. There's always been sure. these painful conversations. We've, you know, this this is real in the church, outside of the church. Mm-hmm. But but in the church, I kept hearing this language of family. Yes. You're our son in the Lord. You're my brother, my sister. And I, I, I was 100% of guilty of that as a lead mm-hmm. pastor in North Carolina. I kept using this language of family as a way to get people to build my kingdom, to mm-hmm. work for my cause, right? So I'm guilty of that one billion percent. 
But it just lied to me. It lied to my heart because it told me no matter what, you're always going to be family. Mm. No matter, okay, maybe we won't invite you to all the conferences like we used to, and maybe we won't, right? But you're always going to be family. There's not a yeah. time where we're just going to tell people, don't help Carlos rebuild homes in Puerto Rico. Mm. That, 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 so it still hurts. And like you're saying, it's happened multiple times, and it's still painful because to me, it is my mm. family. And, and scripturally, as a believer, I have to say, it is my freaking family. And I got to yeah. love this, oh, this freaking family yeah. that's driving me insane right now. But it is my yeah. family and it is the Lord's table. And Jesus had Matthew, mm-hmm. a tax collector who worked for Rome and he had Judas. Right. And he had all these different collection of men and women surrounding him from different worlds. And it's just hard, man, to process yes. the journey of justice and love and grace and challenge yes. and the prophetic witness yes. because the heart is involved because people are involved because old right. relationships are involved and it's just hard i don't have the answer i, I just have a story really mm. and and thinking about how i know even your own story like your experience of um that sort of charismatic pentecostal christianity mm-hmm. brought such healing into your life after the family broke and it's like so that becomes the the means of grace in that way and then you experience this kind of profound brokenness within and on the back end. It's so just mysterious how that works, you know. Mm-hmm. The same thing God uses to bring such healing and restoration then becomes something else that you need therapy yeah. for. You I know? know, legitimately. <laughs> and I'm telling you, man, I, I, I will not let go. I will not let go of the dream. And really, mm-hmm. in a way, it's up to me of whether it's this year or next year, I can see myself flying to Raleigh, flying to other spaces that I've been in the past, that doors have closed. I can see, I can dream it. I can see myself walking there, not as a victim, not as begging for them to take me back, but like just going and washing people's feet and just hugging and loving and bringing offerings. Like, may God bless me. I'll get charismatic now. May God bless me ridiculously. I prophesy that I have so much money that I can go to all those ministries and bless them and support Mm -hmm. them and, I, I, I want to believe that yeah. that is the ultimate goal. And, and I feel hope when I read somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. Because mm. he was fighting for justice and he's speaking truth like it's just a sword that is like literally going through the heart of America. Yeah. And yet his hope ultimately is for us all to be at the table, for us all to yeah. be included, for our children to play together, right? So yes. it, it's painful right now and it's hurt. Mm. It, well, it's been painful for years now, but I just, I, I won't let go of that hope that I can mm. sit at that table with my brothers and sisters who, mm. in a way, have hurt me so hard, and we can love each other again. I just, I, yeah. How do you navigate that tension between, because I feel like you do speak in a way that's loving, and you do speak blessing, mm. and yet finding ways to still tell the truth and tell your truth and offer an alternative witness like how do you how do you parse all of that because uh you know i and i i struggle with this i don't ever feel like i necessarily get it right i feel like you know if you veer even a little bit of course people are eager to tell you if they think that you're getting it wrong like um i mean i i mean but i mean we have it in the new testament paul and peter mano and mano right like it's kind of like <laughs> yeah. they're still they may be brothers in christ that doesn't mean there's not deep disagreement. Deep disagreement and legitimate disagreement. Yes. And I think, I, th- I don't know if I said it the last time we spoke, but I think that is the gift of the Trump era mm. is definition, is clarity. Yeah. I yeah. do know now where those people who were my spiritual fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, I do know clearly where they stand with immigrants. Yeah. And where they stand in terms of racism and nationalism, how much is okay or not okay. And that clarity is a gift because now I can address it and I can actually set healthy boundaries and say, you know what? Mm. I just, that's just, this is a conversation we can't even have. Yeah, I see it so differently and I believe so differently. Um, so there is a gift of clarity which mm. has allowed us to be more defined. And I yes. feel like I'm more defined. It yes. was almost like the Trump era allowed me to deduct. I'm definitely not this. I'm definitely not that. I mm. definitely don't want to be associated with that. Yeah. And yet, okay, but I still have brothers and sisters that do want to be associated with that. 
Mm. And I have friends and, and family members, literal family members. <laughs> My blood runs through their veins that do want to be completely associated with that. So mm. the gift has been the definition. The, yeah. the negative has been the definition. And maybe the definition has brought labels, mm. or godly labels that we keep putting on each other. And we're trying so hard to define each other as one thing or the other. But human beings are way more complex than that. And we have to reject those monolithic yes. kind of like this person is this and that's it. And unfortunately, cancel culture plays a lot into that. It's like yeah. you say the wrong thing that one time, that means you are that the whole time. Yeah. And there's just not one human being that would fit into that, right? So that's right. It's hard because I, 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 what I've chosen to answer your question, which I wasn't answering, <laughs> what I've chosen to no, do. No, you actually are. Okay, good. What I've chosen to do is be a voice as much as I can in things that I'm getting involved in. And when I'm not involved, then I'll find a voice, somebody who is involved in those areas. So if I do want to be involved in the immigration conversation, then I got to be at the border and I got to somehow be involved. And I, obviously I do want to be involved in the conversation about Puerto Rico and about how we treat second class citizens, which really is what we are. We're a colony. I, I'm John, I'm paying $4,000 more in taxes I live in Puerto Rico for this last year and I can't vote for the president. Is that wild or what? Mm, wow. That is literally taxation without representation. Literally. Literally. Wow. It's just the, wow. the most I've ever spent on federal taxes my year, first year in Puerto Rico. It's just stupid. And the same people that will quote Romans 13 about you needing no, to no, no, submit no, to Caesar are the people who fought, who celebrate no. the Revolutionary War over that, that exact principle. <laughs> How's that it's for irony? <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It's just wild. So, what, so, you, I do, so I do yeah. want to keep talking, but I want to talk, trying as much as I can to talk in those spaces where at least, at least my wallet is involved. At least yeah. I'm putting money into it yeah. or my feet into it or... I'm connected to somebody who's really involved and yes. I can kind of yes. promote and exalt their voice in that, in those contexts. You mentioned um, a moment ago being at the border. So you, mm. you spent time there. Yeah. You spent time there recently. Yeah. What have you seen? What have you heard? Oh man, it's so ungodly. It's so ungodly because what's happening is they're just playing with the rules and playing with the law. And it's just so, I mean, that's right. You got to call out the hypocrisy. Law and order, BS, man. They're, they're using the law for a narrative of racism and xenophobia and hate against brown people. Mm. Because to think that if that would ever happen in the Canadian border, that would never happen on a flight that's coming in from England. I mean, it's just wild. It really is racism against brown bodies. And what's happening is, and surprisingly, I've... The amount of Africans that are at the border right now, Jonathan, mm. the amount of Venezuelans that are at the border right now, it's not just Central Americans, even though a lot of them from Nicaragua, Honduras. And in my past trips, my past kind of charismatic Pentecostal mission trips to those countries, I'm now hearing stories that validate their narrative, which is yeah. the violence is insane. Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras, is the murder capital of the world right now. Mm. The gang violence is absolutely atrocious. I know a pastor. His name was Roberto. I stayed in his home about eight years ago when I went with my wife, Catherine, to do a school for leaders in the mountains of Honduras. He was murdered a couple of months ago. Mm. His family's running for their lives. I, mm. these, this is not just... Mm. Narrative against narrative. This is yeah. a racist narr narrative against human beings who are desperate. Mm -hmm. And for my wife who came with me, the, I mean, the shocking thing seeing pregnant mothers, newborn babies living in these makeshift camps that are all over Tijuana. Um, it's, just, it's just painful. It's real human beings. Their stories matter. And what we're doing at the border is absolutely atrocious. And here's the thing. We don't really know the extent and the amount of people that are being put in detention centers. They keep moving them. Yeah. They keep, I mean, it's, it, I don't want to be part of in 50 years, there's those Disney movies about what happened at the border and they're kind of yeah. cute, but they're kind of show a little bit of the racism, you know, like those movies they make and they give you, they always give you that one kind of white caricature racist guy. Mm. No, it's happening in, in a big scale. Yes. Um, and, and it's just, 
we have to do something about it. We got to talk about it. I'm not saying that I have all the information, sure. but I have enough information to know that it's evil, it's wrong, and it needs to stop. So what do you do? And I'm asking this strategically because I feel like um, for some of the folks who listen to us, I I mean, I'm just very, I'm keenly aware of some of the specific other narratives that are out there. Sure. So what do you do with something like, and I'm not um, trying to make this about any particular personalities, of course, but something like roughly a month ago or so, Samuel Rodriguez, what organization is he the head of? Um, the Hispanic Caucus or something. I, I, Sammy's a Puerto Rican. He's got my last name. I've seen him yes. speak. He's, yes. he's, he's Pentecostal. Yes. Um, he very, and he's, they did a lot of good in Puerto Rico okay. after the hurricane. So I got to give credit where credit is due. Yes. They were involved. They moved stuff. Um, so yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. I just wanted to make sure. Oh, no, that, no, 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 no. The contextualizing is good. Please. So him and a group of pastors mm-hmm. uh, schedule a visit to the border. They go, they spend a couple hours there. They come out and say, yeah. the media is making all this up about conditions at the border. All the credible reporting from all kinds of sources, all the most credible sources, they say it's all bunk, it's all BS. Yeah. We, we, we've been to a detention center. Everything's fine. Like, what, what, do, you, what do you do with that? Yeah, well, it, obviously, just one detention center doesn't um, provide clarity to everything. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those pastors were part of the president's evangelical council. We know that they're going in already with an agenda. Um, and there are parts, and there are Border Patrol people who are decent, godly people who are sure. trying to do right. And so sure. that's why these monolithic kind of explanations of these boxes, they don't work because yeah. there are good people, good conservative evangelical churches at the border that are trying to help the migrants that are coming. I know because I've heard them, I've met with them, I've spoken to them, et cetera, et cetera. But the systemic problem, right, the border is very long and... There's too many stories, too many lives, too many deaths of children Mm. while in the custody of the American government for us to be like, we visited for 30 minutes and it was okay. It's not okay. Um, And we have to highlight the stories of these beautiful migrants, um, these beautiful asylum seekers, powerful people taking courageous journeys I mean, of they're brave, they're courageous, they're, they're, they're taking high risk. We have to listen to their stories. I, it's such an American thing to say, I'll do anything for my children. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, no matter what happens, I'll do anything for my kids. It's like, yeah. that's the most like American thing to say. Mm-hmm. And that's what they are doing. They're doing yes. anything yes. to bring their kids to a better world, to save mm-hmm. them from violence, from crime, from hunger, from devastation. Mm-hmm. And it's just a shame that um, we are allowing a few voices um, to, you know, to drive that narrative. A few minutes ago, you referenced kind of in passing as we're talking about Mm -hmm. some of these deep divisions, deep disagreements, tensions we're navigating. You talked about spiritual fathers and mothers. And I know this is a conversation I feel like personally we've had a lot before, but I feel like it's, it's, it's so relevant. It's so needed because, you know, and I even just coming back from, um, being in the Netherlands and Ireland, uh, I, I, I don't go anywhere where I'm with Christians right now where there's not some kind of really painful conversation about this growing sense of generational divide. And I don't want to oversimplify because I know people of all ages, of course, you know, um, who, are, who are on a journey. But it does seem like that there is a lot that's happening gener- generationally, even the charismatic movement we talked about before. Um, you you recently, well, it's been a little while, but you've, I love this piece of yours, A Letter to Our Conservative Parents, because I feel like it prophetically, powerfully, concisely mm-hmm. speaks to that tension. Can you say a bit of even just what you're seeing, what you're sensing, what you're discerning about this kind of generational rift, even and perhaps especially among believers when it comes yeah. to the kind of things we're talking about now. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's even saying they're still parents. It, even that's heavy because mm. for so many people in the journeys, like I, did, I don't even want to read. I don't even want to use any language that would make me relate to them Yeah, because yeah. the brokenness is so real and I don't sure. want to unvalidate that. Right. Because right. I know people who have been so hurt 
it's right for them to say, I don't want anything to do with that church or with that ministry. It's a yeah. godly thing to set those really good boundaries and say mm -hmm. enough. Um, mm -hmm. But for those who are of us who are in the journey and maybe have passed that, maybe those, those times of legit bitterness and pain and, and righteous anger, and maybe hopeful that we can, we're not going to agree on everything and we're not going to connect yeah. on everything. But maybe, maybe there's a hope that, you know, that prophetic word in Malachi, that Old Testament finishes, finishes yes. with that, that God will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Yes. And, and that is an invitation from God. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's kind of scary because it says, because if not, I will destroy their land. Yeah. And, you know, as Jesus followers, we know that that's part of the work of Jesus is to redeem all those things that would have brought destruction in the past. Now there's an opportunity for them to bring life. And so I'm writing a letter saying we're different. You're conservative. I can't, I can't honestly use that label anymore. It's too loaded. It's too contaminated. It doesn't represent me or where I am right now in my journey. Mm -hmm. And, but maybe the word conservative does work because I do want to conserve the words of Jesus. And I do, yeah. in a really weird way, want to go back to the old way, right, of, yeah. of the Jesus way, just the pure yes. way of like love and, and sacrifice and service and feet washing and healing. And, yes. and I love how Jesus is so specific, even in the Great Commission, like heal the person with leprosy. Like yeah. find the one that society has labeled as the worst, the most yeah. rejected and make sure you go to them. Yeah. Um, we don't have people with leprosy now, but we do have people that the church or the religious systems even more have mm -hmm. said those are really the ones you shouldn't even touch. And Jesus is saying, go directly to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling, I'm writing this this letter, and it's I'm, that's the one that kind of people have connected to and have shared. And I've gotten a lot of conservative parents, you know, big time. I'm talking names that you and I would clearly know who have yeah. ri written to me saying, that you're so condescending. That's not the mm. way to approach it. Wow. No, we, it's your problem. You guys need to go back to the word. Mm. You don't really know how bad this, that, that is. Mm. <clears throat> so there's been like a legitimate negative response to it. But in general, wow. people have connected to it positively because I'm trying my best and I'm not yeah. great at it, but I'm trying my best in an honoring way. Say we are so different in this yeah. moment in time right now feels like we are so split and so divided. Is yeah. there any way that we can explain ourselves so that at least you can come back to the table to talk? Because mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm just, maybe I'm foolish to still hope, but I, mm -hmm. as, a, as a man who I really now have a great relationship with my dad, even though there was so much yeah. brokenness in the past, I do still see the value of spiritual parents, of older people. And, and that's the thing that I'm rediscovering even here in Puerto Rico. Most of what we're doing in the mountains, again, single mothers and elderly people, and just fixing the roof of an elderly person and allowing them to just talk to you. I mean, sometimes we spend three days at the house of a 90-year-old grandma, and she's just telling me stories. And I want to learn from her. I want to listen to her stories. And in that same spiritual context, I want to learn from those people that came before me, even though we might have gotten into a different place now. There's still there's still gems in there. There's still value. Yes, yes. And and again, I'm just there's still I'm still speaking from a place of pain, mm. but at a place of hope. Yeah, like this whole family thing, man. If we're not family, then what the freak are we doing? Absolutely. I thought there's such hope and power and passion and anointing. Even in that letter, it's kind of shocking to me that any well-known Christian leaders would respond negatively to it because it's like, but there again, we're in a time where so many people choose ideology yeah. is runs deeper than anything, Run, apparently more than so than the body and blood of Jesus, uh, more so than any or, or shared experience of the, the presence of God or like any of the, um, what I, I hate that I always tee you up on this, Carlos, but it's, and, and I, you know, I always want to be clear when I say this, that when I do share this story, I don't share it as my own story. I do share it as your story. I you but I, on, a, on an actual, this is not exaggeration, on a weekly basis, <laughs> I share the story of your mentor who gave you this, the most self-aware prophetic word I've ever heard of. Prophetic word I've ever heard. <laughs> because I still, and, and, and you know, it's interesting because even, I've never told that story to someone who's navigating attention like this. Mm -hmm. that didn't hear it with like surprise and hope mm -hmm. 
Yes. Because they feel such, they, they just feel the possibility and beauty in it. So if you yes. could tell that story love to, for people yeah. who haven't heard it, yeah. I would appreciate it. Yes, I would love to. So I spent a good amount of time, um, you know, kind of school of ministry, the classic short-term school of ministry turned into, hey, stay around, you're a good kid, we'll, we'll make you an intern, not pay you anything, but you, you, know, you can help us build this. And I was in your 20s, you just want to be part of whatever is good and healthy and people in movement. And so I was part of this movement, um, charismatic movement, well-known movement, and they welcomed me, they loved me. Mm-hmm. And the, the pastor of that movement took me in like a spiritual son. And we use that language. And to this day, I can honestly tell you, in my heart, there's still a space where they are parents for me, mm-hmm. right? And they did walk a journey with me. I was a nervous public speaker, and they kept putting me in big crowds. I'm talking mm-hmm. thousands of people, 21, 22 years old. They would give me big crowds. And I, you know, I developed abilities because of them. They would train me, give me feedback, love me through it. And when I sucked, they would just hug me and mm. kiss me and give me encouragement. And at the end of my time with them, I had kind of an exit inter- interview. And he told me, uh, who you know, the guy who was the pastor, who was my spiritual dad at that time, he said, Carlos, one day you're going to call me and you're going to tell me about all the things that God's doing in your life. And that day, son, will be that day where I'm going to say to you, that's not God. And when I tell you that, remember when I tell you that, that, that it is God. Mm. And just keep going. Do not quit. Mm. Keep going. Man, he told me that and it, it landed in my heart. I took it with me. I reminded him of that many times after that. <laughs> mm. Because we started to have those conversations where he started to say, what you're doing is not God. You're missing mm. your ministry, your calling. Remember those days when we were together. You're called to be a revivalist. You're called to be this and that and the other. Mm. What you're doing is not God. And I wow. would keep reminding him of that conversation we had. And mm. he told me those words because when his ministry at that time was growing and exploding and things were happening that were outside of the norm his his own spiritual fathers if we're okay using that language so yeah. much but his own spiritual father said to him this is not god and that's when he knew yeah. deep in his heart it's so different it's so out of the box it's such yeah. a new wineskin that yeah. the old wineskins can't contain it mm. and you got to drink that new wine and you yeah. got to go for it. So and you can't go back. Oof. You can't. You literally can't go back. You actually can't. Like you, you it's like you physically can't. You just know you, it. You thank you. You literally can't go back. Mm. And it's painful again. <laughs> I keep mm. talking about the pain because it's real. Yeah. Because those were spaces where I grew. Like you said, I got so much healing. Yes. I got so much yes. encouragement. I got so much platform and opportunity yeah. and growth and yeah. and learning and whatnot. And, but you can't go back. And I, so, so the way that you use my story, I use your teaching of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mm. I'm, I'm, I, so you give me credit. I don't give you credit just so you know. It's, <laughs> it's in the text, brother. I can't take credit for something that's in the text. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the text, baby. <laughs> I think I was at church on Morgan in Raleigh last time I was there. I, I'm pretty sure I preached like a 70% Jonathan Martin sermon. People oh, that's hilarious. It, like it was mine. <laughs> I'd be honored. You go for it. You should. No, that's amazing. Man, no, no, I, but, I love that but, story but so really, much because I feel like it's like even though – yeah, you still had the conversations later where it's like, no, this isn't God, mm-hmm. and and we did. nobody, none of us live in that kind of awareness forever. There's still such hope in it for what could there be. So much hope to acknowledge so the limits hope. of our own wisdom, yes. and to say like, yes. carry this, carry yes. this further than yes. I'm able to take it. Yeah, literally, man. Uh, and and that self awareness is beautiful. It Oof. was a gift, not just teaching me, not just a statement. But even yeah. there's going to be a time where you and I are going to have to be aware yeah. that we can't go places that the next generation needs to 100%. go. And sometimes I'm, I'm feeling like that already in yeah. so many ways. Yeah, I, looked, I, I look at some, at some of the conversations some of our 17 and 18-year-old friends are having, and it's just like, I know. dang, we're like, we need to catch up, bro. 
I, I feel like um, a dinosaur these days. It's funny for all the folks I'm that act like we're on some you. radical bleeding edge. It's like, <laughs> nope. I feel like I'm Bro, like Fred Flintstone, seriously, pedaling the the car like my feet, and it's like, you know, what on earth? <laughs> the way they're thinking about church, about worship, yes, about missions. Yes. I mean, it's language that I, I'm like, what? Can you repeat yeah. that again? Yeah. But then when yeah. they do speak it from the heart, it makes sense to me, and I. So I want to have that same self awareness in yes. those spaces that I'm not as yes. far as I should be. I feel like this is such a beautiful conversation and it's constructive. So kind of as we're wrapping up, I don't want to backtrack to something negative, but this is like something you said earlier. This is just a lingering question that it's something I think about a lot, but I don't know yet if I've had anybody uh, in my life really speak to it. I'm just curious what you say, because you said something there like, because we talked about because, and I, you know, I think again, you're, you're always... Um, doing both and not either or kind of work. And I think even when we use a label kind of in a drive-by way, I mean, clearly so much of what we're doing is we're trying to transcend labels and push the boundaries, et cetera. Sure. But, we, you know, if, if we talk about, and I'll use quotation marks if I have to, but if we talk about people who are more conservative, who yeah. are scandalized because they feel like the table's becoming too open or it's becoming too political, et cetera, et cetera. You said something earlier that caught, because, you know, keep in mind, um, in the process of planning a new church, essentially, sure. I, I say yeah. community, it's you a did. church in Oklahoma City called the a table. church, brother. In this love it. time, what you said about how often more progressive, quotation marks, people sure. cheer you on, this is great, they love it, maybe they'll hit the retweet button. But in terms of giving mm-hmm. and showing up, yeah, it's it's weird. Does it man. always happen? It's weird. What's up with that? I think I think there is, and I'm I'm a I, I've had beautiful experiences on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and I've had horrible experiences. I think social media is lying to us. It's telling mm. us, hey, you're doing it because you retweeted yeah, yeah. or you liked yeah, it or you said yeah. it. And I don't want to devalue how important that is. Yes. Those because it legitimately is first steps. Yes. Valuable first steps for some people. Their lives were transformed because they were exposed to those kind of conversations, mm-hmm. and they were given permission to explore those mm-hmm. topics about you know uh, whatever it is. And so I think in a way it is because we are so engaged in the conversation. We're lying to us ourselves about actually being engaged in the mm-hmm. problems and the solutions to those conversations, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. Sure. There's no doubt about it. And in a way, I'm trying to force myself. I'm like, move to Puerto Rico, go to Tijuana, get yeah. involved, go to the protest, give yeah. money now. And I'm, and I, in a way, have to coach myself out of the complacency mm-hmm. and into the go. And I'll, I'll get really preachy now, but I just, I. Because it works in English. I can't preach it in Spanish. But the gospel without the go is just a spell. Mm. And you're just in the spell mm. of here's my offering and here's the worship yes. and here's the right Bible verse. Without the going, it really is just a spell. It's just like we're, mm. you're just caught up in the saying the right thing. And and and, and I, I, I fear for um, some of my progressive friends and some of this, like the cancel culture and this whole... Like it's got to be said the perfect way and we're not giving yes. enough space for people in journey. And it's, it's, it's great to be challenged in the journey. Actually, when people challenge you in the journey, it helps you move either forward to say, yeah, I do need to move this direction or actually say, mm-hmm. you know what? I actually don't believe that. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying let people just get away with anything, but mm-hmm. if we're just canceling people out, like you said the wrong thing. So now forget about you. You're not yeah. far enough. And, and we're missing out from actually, hey, let's walk the journey together. Let's actually go yeah. march together. Like literally go to Washington and go to that march that we need to show up. And mm-hmm. let's go to the border and show up where, you know, I love what I'm seeing from the, the Jewish youth. They're, you mm-hmm. know, they're blockading yes, ICE. Yes. And let's go join them like together, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't really know. Is it right? It just happened in Puerto Rico. And I, one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen, it's my mom holding a sign saying Ricky Renuncia, which is telling the governor to quit, next to Lugaro, which was a candidate for the governor of Puerto Rico, who's mm-hmm. an atheist lady who's saying, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. The church should just 
wow. and there's my mom who's a conservative <laughs> Christian right yeah. next to Lugaro and and my mom kept saying to me and there's kids doing graffiti all over old San Juan and there's wow. older people marching but there was a sense in the whole island for the people who were there marching mm-hmm. we're different but we belong here yeah. at least we're here we're marching yeah. we're saying we're standing up mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I think I I I I started to think about that and I'm sorry that I I'm terrible with English names Stone Douglas was the school that was there was a shooting in Florida was it Stone Douglas? Do you remember what the name of that school was? Because there was that massive shooting in Florida, and these young people started to speak up. And there was not, a Latino girl. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Not right? Parkland? Yeah, Parkland, okay, of course. Parkland, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. in Parkland, Florida. Thank you. It's just the, the name of the school. I always try to remember yeah. the name of the school. Mm-hmm. What happened in Parkland? There was a Latino girl who's bisexual. There's the white boy who's just like a white 17-year-old who comes from a yeah. wealthy family who goes to the school. There's yeah. that black girl that was like 13 years old who was really eloquent when she was speaking. There's all there's a collection of people that are so different, but they're united yeah. in that one thing. We need mm-hmm. to get rid of guns, assault mm-hmm. weapons, these rifles that killed our friends. We need to stop them. They ended up moving a million people to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And I follow a lot of them on Twitter. They do not stop. They, they are relentless. Stop. Not just talking about it on Twitter, but marching. Right. And we met with the senator and we did. And they, again, talking about that generation yeah. from 13 to 17 year olds, so different one to the other, but right. united in that one mission and going. Yes. And, yes. and I, I, that's, they're representing to me. And I think you were the one who tweeted one time about the move of God. And we're, we've been waiting for the move of God where it's on the streets and it's being led by people like them. Like that revival that we prayed for and that reformation yeah. that we've been wanting. It's happening. It's yeah. just not happening in the context that we wanted it to happen. Because right. we wanted it in the church so we could control it and manipulate yeah. it and make money off of it. Yeah. But it's actually happening on the streets where things are being transformed and changed where it needs mm-hmm. to happen. So, yeah, all that ramble to say we, we actually need to go. There is no there is no gospel yeah. without the go. Yeah. And, and I think that's and, where, you know, and I, not, again, just trying to sets you off with more preaching here, but I feel like that's where, at least for me, um, the Jesus component is so significant because I don't like, I'm not at all, I don't judge anybody's spirit. Truly. I'm not standing in judgment over anybody, but I still feel like they're, the work is so hard. Mm. The climate's so tough. Mm. You'll burn yourself out. I just think Mm. without, some kind of spiritual transformation without something robust happening in here, how on earth would you even be sustained to do the work? I, you know, it just seems like in some ways a vibrant connection with mm. God, some kind of deep life of the soul, mm. some kind of, of of prayer life, if you will, becomes yes, so yes. essential because, yeah. you know, anger will get you out the drive. And I think that's fine. I think there's righteous yeah. ways that yes. that happens. But yes. in terms of the sustaining work Impossible. of like social transformation, good Impossible. grief. Like you just, it, it, it takes something deeper than. It does. It does. And, and, and why I, again, read so much and celebrate so much the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Because as a preacher, just to think about that for you and me, we're preachers like a yes. man preaching mm-hmm. gospel and transforming society through preaching, through nonviolence, right. while always having the hope of our children playing together, while always having like, it's too great of a burden. Hate is too great of a burden. I, yes. I'm here to call out the hate. I'm here to call out the racism, but yes. I won't become that which I won't become the monster that I'm trying to bring down. Yeah. I won't become the giant that I'm trying to, you know, destroy. And, yeah. and that's, and that, that tension is perfectly for me as a follower of Jesus, perfectly exemplified in Jesus himself. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the humility and the care and the love mm-hmm. and the sensitivity. And yet like the rage against those systemics, you know, Yes. Issues that are trying to bring people down. Mm. There's nobody like Jesus to me to follow, to learn from, to try to understand and mm. to try to emulate. Um, and, you know, I, I like to say if I'm so willing to turn the tables at the temple, but Jesus was also willing to die for the people he was turning the table. Wow, right. That's and, right. And, and that's that tension. And you just, yes. again, as a follower of Jesus, I got to live in that tension. I got to figure out how to keep walking that tension and living that. Because if we're not careful, and I think this is such a uh, an issue in progressive culture, and I will say this gently because these are people like I, that I that I actually I dearly love. Um, yeah. But I feel like I have so many conversations with folks now who, um, at this point, you know, are not 
not practicing any sort of faith. And again, nothing but like respect for that. But it becomes like never participated in a protest, never participated in anything constructive, never got involved, whatever. But like there are ways of expressing some version of social conscience. Like I'll actually hear things like, well, I'll never have a conversation with a white man type stuff where it's like, <laughs> friend, I love you. But it's like there's still this like, you know, kind of hanging out in the basement. And it's like whether or not like you follow Jesus, like I hope you get a broader vision for 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 building something <laughs> than, than that. Because because I just because if it's just another version of fundamentalism where if somebody doesn't have the orthodoxy, oh, you disagree with this on point nine? Well, you're not one of us. Ah, I'll tweet against you. You know, like what is, what is that? Like I, I have come way too far from some of that kind of stuff that I come from to get caught up in that kind of nonsense now. And it is not, a, I, I, it, it's not beautiful. It's not good. That doesn't no. appeal to me. No, it doesn't. And, and to be honest with you, the more even being here in Puerto Rico and going to the border, they could care less about those arguments we're having. Yeah. They just need yeah. food and water and shelter. They need yes. to get through. They need to reconnect with their kids. And so, and that, mm. that's what's, that helps me. Right. As mm -hmm. I go to the spaces and places that I'm trying to speak into by actually being there, I realize the conversations that are absolutely irrelevant, unhelpful, mm -hmm. stupid in a way, silly to be having mm -hmm. um, because there's conversations that are deeper, that are more important, that are actually mm -hmm. like life or death conversations. Yes. As yes, opposed yes. to I feel comfortable or not conversations or I feel better about myself or not conversations. Right. So it's in those spaces that I, I, I learn about what really matters and that I hear God and it has become my prayer in a weird way, bro. It's like, <laughs> I, I knew nothing about construction and mm. I'm just falling in love with like getting on a roof and just like mm. building a frame and putting the tin on and making sure no water goes through mm. and making sure it looks good and it sounds good when it rains and mm. making sure there's no, leftover debris i'm finding that's that's become worship to me yeah that's become like legitimate joy yeah. and those conversations i'm having with those people that were there in those conditions for two years um it it, it kind of clarifies things so it's beautiful i force myself to go and i'm encouraging mm -hmm. those who are listening who do care because i know people care yes. that's why they yes. talk about it because they care that's right but just get your legs to care with you and i promise you it'll be so much better it's actually yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. Language matters, but if Christian spirituality teaches us anything at all, it's that the whole story is that the word became flesh. If it's not incarnate, if it's not embodied, all the beautiful language in the world, the right language, what does it matter? It's still dead. So on that note, because what a great way to close for people who are stirred right now and want to do something. Yeah. Carlos, what can they do? Oh, man. I moved to Puerto Rico to rebuild homes and just as much to host people. Mm. And I know there's important conversations to be had about missions and how we've done it and white savior complex. Let's have those conversations here at my dinner table. I'll make you a mojito, mm. some rice and beans, some plantains, and we can have those conversations. But being present in here in Puerto Rico, if you go to the happynpo.com, You'll learn about what we're doing, how you can get involved. Um, we're starting now to do some trips. We're actually spending Thanksgiving in Tijuana. We're going to wow. do a big feast, Thanksgiving feast. Traveling on Thanksgiving Day is so cheap because nobody wants to travel on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, interesting. So maybe the one year that you sacrifice this great holiday yeah. to come and be with us in Tijuana um, to serve the people there. We're actually, re we're actually building new homes um, mm. for one of the shelters because we want to bring dignity. It's not just like, again, it's not a cheap handout. Like, how can we bring dignity to people? We like to yeah. bring flowers, toys for the kids, play with them, sit, eat with them, bring nice meat, mm -hmm. um, build homes that are safe, that are secure. We do that in Puerto Rico. We're starting to do that now um, in Tijuana also. And people can join us. I, I'm all about bringing people with me on the journey. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a thing that we've been talking about. I would say maybe more than half of the people that come are more from the conservative churches, mm -hmm. conservative um, background. Um, some still go into the churches, some not anymore. Um, yeah. But they're wanting to come. And it's in those journeys, it's in the knowing the names and the faces mm -hmm. of people that transformation truly happens. 
Um, there is an illusion of proximity. You know, people say, oh, I have a black friend, so I'm not a racist. So right. that's not what I'm trying to say. But yes. there is a power also in proximity yes. where actually it's not just being close to your black friend. It's actually hearing his story mm. and his perspective and allowing that to transform you. Listening mm. not to respond, but to understand. And you can do that by coming with us to Puerto Rico or coming with us to the border. We also have a children's home in Peru. We support the children's home where our daughter came from in Ethiopia. So we do a lot of stuff. But um, hosting you in Puerto Rico or Tijuana would be amazing. HappyNPO.com. Give me some bucks, baby. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. <laughs> and I want everybody to read Drop the Stones. I want everybody to read your book, follow you Thanks, on Twitter, man. Instagram, Thanks, all the man. things. Um, well, Carlos, I just, you know... I know that you're dealing with your own level of discouragement and we all get it, but man, I just want you to hear like there's nobody out there who inspires me more. And in terms of like, you know, just the fire in my own bones, like everything you, there's probably nobody I retweet more than you. I just feel like I, I love, I love your, your heart, your energy, your vision, your language, like all of it. It's so special. It's so unique. It's so the kingdom of God. So just just know that you're making a difference for so many of us and for leaders. I know so many leaders who are listening and who are being shaped. And and I know that you're not, this isn't something that you would say about yourself, you're aspiring to. But I feel like for people who are struggling because they don't feel like they've got fathers and mothers in the in the faith, you know, I'm just seeing you as one of those people who's filling in that space for folks and it's a big yeah. deal. So well, Thank you for what you're doing, my friend. I love you, and I'm so grateful to too, have you in my man. life. I love you too, brother. You're the best. Keep on it, baby. Well, I appreciate it, my stuff. friend, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Zeitcast. I'm not going to give a whole another spill because I just want you to go flood <laughs> Carlos' website, buy <laughs> shirts, go to Puerto Rico, do all the things. <laughs> all That's what I want. So thanks so much for hanging out, my friend, and we will yeah, talk again soon. I love you. Love, you, love all you guys. Too.